So, can we hear again for Marta, our first lady speaker? Yay! Okay. So, let's move on. Up next is Andris uh, Berzins. Uh, well, now hold on. He's a managing partner at Change Ventures and a prominent leader in Baltic startup ecosystem and co founder of Tech Hub Riga and Tech Chill. He now leads the Baltic Seed Investment Fund Change Ventures. And in the past, he has held leadership roles at various startups, including Aeroscout and Book, Book a Table. He is a former Bain and Company strategist and investment advisor at Creendom and holds an MBA from Stanford Graduate School of Business. Well, that's some serious stuff. So let's welcome on stage Andres. Thank you. Morning, everyone. Such a lovely day to be here in Vilnius. Um, such sunshine that half of you have to sit under the shade so you don't get sunburned. Everyone here, enjoy the sunburn. I'm just kidding. It's uh, not actually that bad yet, but. Um, uh, delighted to be here. Uh, very happy to be back in Vilnius um, here on a regular basis, but this is definitely the place we want to be. So I see slides up there, but not down here, but I guess we'll, um, we'll do this. So I want to talk about getting your startup ready to raise uh, VC money. Um, and I'll start by introducing um, who we are, what Change Ventures is. So Change Ventures is a fund that I'm managing partner of. Um, uh, we're a venture capital fund. We invest in s Baltic founders. So we back uh, founding teams from the Baltic states who are building world-class scalable businesses. And we're very excited about uh, the kind of companies that are coming out of all three Baltic states now. And, uh, and we want to be uh, typically the first uh, fund investor in these kind of companies. We invest somewhere between 50 and 300,000 usually in the first investment. Um, and uh, we are trying to be much more straightforward than some of the traditional investors here in terms of having a simple plain language term sheet, having straightforward terms, uh, uh, simple processes, because the main thing is to get you the cash to be able to start to build the business and figure out uh, how to make it really scale big. So we have seven investments already uh, from the fund, um, and uh, we're very excited. On the left, Interactio is our Lithuanian investment from Klaipeda. Um, they do real-time audio streaming, uh, mainly for uh, simultaneous interpretation. And um, we have other investments across Estonia and Latvia, um, and planning to do a lot more. So let me talk about VCs. So what's different about VCs? Because there are different ways, different sources from which you can fund your startup, angel investors. Um, you can also look at funds. Um, and the difference uh, that you need to understand about a venture capital fund is that venture capital funds are largely investing other people's money. So the way a venture capital fund is set up is um, a small amount of the fund is typically invested by the people running the fund and, and uh, uh, managing the money but most of the money is someone else's. It might be an endowment, it might be the European Investment Fund, which is part of the European Union, it might be government funds from, uh, from your, 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 your government, but it's someone else's money, it might be pension money. And these investors are looking to the venture capital fund to return multiples of their investment. So give me at least 2x back, 3x back, 4x back. Um, so that is what they're looking for. And the venture capitalist's job is to look at all the possible investments out there, select the best ones they can, and to get a great return um, on the investments they make. And this has implications. So it has implications in terms of what the process is. So unlike an angel investor, an angel investor uh, is typically investing their own personal cash, and they could more or less sit at the coffee table here, decide that you're a great team, a very interesting, exciting startup, and more or less say on the spot, all right, I'm going to invest, whatever, 20,000. Um, and a venture capital fund uh, will typically not be doing that. They usually have a partnership of several people, and they have some kind of decision-making process. Um, and in inherently, they have a what's called a fiduciary duty to manage the money, so they have to have some kind of process. Some are longer, some are shorter. We try to be very quick. We especially try to give 
the answer, no, we're not going to invest as quickly as possible rather than keep people hanging. But inevitably, one of the things you need to understand is that there is a process. Um, and the important thing as a startup is to ask, what is the process? Who actually decides on this investment? You might be meeting with one person. How many more people in the partnership? What is the investment committee? Who decides? These are questions that many startup founders do not ask. It's a perfectly legitimate question. You should ask, and every investor should be willing to clearly tell you what is that process. But it's important to understand that there is some kind of a decision-making process, an investment committee that needs to make a formal decision. Um, maybe for very small investments, they can do it individually, but that might be different for a larger one. So, uh, so that's important to understand. The second is that um, the returns to investors for venture capital funds are usually driven by a very small proportion of their investments. So as a fund, we might do 35 investments. Um, we're expecting that one or two of those investments will produce the majority of returns for our, invest for, 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 for our investors, right? This is, a, this is a hits business in the sense that um, many of the investments we make, a whole bunch of them will actually, will have to write off the investment. We won't get any return. Um, some of them will get some return, and then there should be a handful that we make amazing returns on, and that pays for everything else, including running the fund. And this is important to understand because um, for, for two reasons. So one is um, you need to show the venture capitalist how your company could be that company that returns the fund and more, right? How is that company going to be uh, potentially a hundred million uh, or more exit? or a billion dollar exit, depending on what kind of fund you're, you're talking to. So that is something to keep in mind because that is what the venture capitalists need, need to look for. They need to look for something which has the potential. You know, there may be all sorts of things unclear and not ready, but it has the potential to get to that point. Um, the second thing is that over the life of the fund, not all of these uh, investments will work out. So uh, you need to look for um, a, an investor that will also support you in the hard times, you know, when you didn't make that fundraise, when the customers didn't come back, when the customers canceled the contract, when your churn was too high, how will they help you get through these inevitable difficult times? And that's the part that an investor should be, should be helping you with. So in terms of getting ready, so the first thing is aim at really big markets, but have a laser-like focus. And this is the number one thing for a founder to think about, and it's kind of counterintuitive. So how can I aim at a huge market, but be really, really focused? Um, and the trick is, uh, and the reason you need to be really focused is because you're a tiny team, you can only achieve a very limited set of things at one time. So you need to really focus on a very small set of things to actually move, move the needle and, 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 and get progress. But at the same time, your market size has to be big. So the, the way to sort of understand this conundrum is that um, you need to have a connection between these two things, right? You need to be saying, I have a specific set of users or customers. Here's the problem I'm solving. Here's how I solve it. Here's how my solution solves that problem. Here's the, the, the customers I'm going to make happy. And they are a very narrow set. I can really focus in on them, make, make my product extremely clear, um, deliver perfect value for that small set of customers, and I can actually achieve that in the near term. But then you need to have behind it, so if I can do this, I'm telling you I'll be able to do this, if I can do this, then behind that, it's logically understandable that there will be then this whole raft of other opportunities, similar customers, may, customers may be slightly different, a broader market behind it. And so your job as a startup founder is to paint this very focused, here's what we're doing right now, and connect it to this much larger picture. And that is sort of the concept that any venture investor needs to buy into because they need to A, see that you have focus and you're not gonna like shoot all over the place, and B, they need to understand that if you can focus and you can execute, that there will be something very big that could become one of these 100 million billion exits. So that's, that's the first thing in terms of getting ready. Sec second thing is do your homework, okay? So I can't tell you how annoying it is to receive an email that is obviously a generic email to 
50 or 100 investors that hasn't been tailored at all, and you have not thought at all about why Change Ventures might be the investor that you're interested in, right? So we'll look at a bunch of those emails, but I'll immediately think that that founder hasn't really done their homework, right? Because uh, there, there's usually a narrow set of investors that are really quite suitable for exactly the, the kind of business you're building, and you will be much more successful if you do the research up front, and instead of targeting 100 possible investors, you do the research and you target maybe 20. Um, and you think about what are the investors, who are, what else have they invested in that might, be, uh, might give them insights that would be useful for you, might give them contacts that would be useful for you, uh, might give them experience in that industry that could be useful to you. Uh, are they investing at the right stage? So if you're raising a seed round and they're really an A round or a growth investor, don't waste, don't waste the time, right? So, so do the research, do your homework, and then I would actually say every single email you send needs to be tailored for that investor. And think about the little things you can say that connect. I, I saw you made an investment in this. That would you know, be logical to connect to this, blah, 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 right? So think about that. And second is do your homework in terms of trying to find an introduction. So the natural way that venture capitalists who receive a lot of inbound deal flow, the natural way of filtering all that deal flow is who made the introduction, right? So if there's a guy I know for a long time and I think is very cap capable and well-connected and they introduce this startup to me, I'm going to pay more attention. I'm going to spend more time looking at what this is than in the cold email. So it doesn't mean don't send a cold email. That may work as well. But it's always better if you have someone that can make an introduction and a recommendation. Number three, so whenever possible, get to know the investors early. So uh, I don't know if any of you have uh, read Mark Suster's blog post. Mark Suster is a venture capitalist from Los Angeles. Um, the blog is called Both Sides of the Table. It's absolutely fantastic. He really writes very well a about a lot of things. Uh, related to startups and funding. And uh, one of his best posts um, is called, uh, we invest in lines, not uh, dots, right? So we wanna, uh, the, the concept is, as an investor, you want to see the founder, uh, the founding team over some period of time and understand how they perform, ideally before you make the investment, right? So you will, you will have a much harder time meeting uh, meeting a venture capital fund for the first time on a Tuesday and try and agree on Wednesday to get an investment when you've never met the team before. It's much different if six months earlier you had a coffee meeting, you maybe introduced that um, meeting by saying we're not raising yet, we wanted to have a, have a chat, tell you, what, tell, tell you what we are doing, where we're going, um, get to know them, then six months later when you meet them again, they have something to measure against, right? So they, they may pick up the information that, that uh, you gave them six months ago and they'll say, all right, so you were planning to do this, this, and this, so how did that pan out? And of course, this, this, and this will not all work out because it's startups, Inevi inevitably something doesn't work out, something has to change, but the investors are looking for the explanation of why, what happened, how did you deal with that? Um, how have you managed that as a team? How have you made, made progress? How have you navigated the inevitable problems that you will come up against? Um, and so uh, look for opportunities, um, especially the networking events and everything else, to connect with investors also before your fundraising. And don't feel shy about specifically stating that you are not fundraising yet. So you can say, so we're a startup X, we're uh, just getting the business going. We'd like to get to know you. We'll be raising maybe in six months' time, maybe even in a year's time, right? Or we've, you know, we did our seed round, you know, then, you know, it's a few months later, we want to get to know you. Uh, we'll be doing our A round at some time in, you know, nine months or whatever it is. Once you start to make these connections earlier, you'll be in a much better position when you start to fundraise because what you actually want to do is make the fundraising as short, as focused as possible 
bringing all those relationships back online and saying, okay, now we're fundraising. And that's much easier to do if you've built those relationships up front. So that's uh, something that would be uh, really important to do. So getting your metrics right. So um, this is uh, a partially hidden uh, a screen from one of our startups on their monthly report that they put together, which they also send to investors. And uh, there are two real things that I see startups typically not getting organized and ready for in terms of their metrics um, in the early days. So one of them is uh, revenue recognition. So how many of you here have studied business or accounting? Put up your hands. A bunch of you. All right. So accounting can be really boring. Okay, I've studied business. Accounting can be really boring. But there's some basic things that are not that hard to learn, but which are really important for thinking about, uh, be, for being able to clearly state how your business is doing. So <clears throat> revenue recognition is one in terms of um, when I uh, have a customer who sends me a, an order for, I don't know, 1,000 euros, that's a booking, so they're, they're sending you an order that they will pay you a thousand euros for something. At the point in time at which you um, deliver that service or product, you can now book a thousand in revenues. And the point in time at which you collect that thousand in money is the point of time at which the cash flow is, is, uh, is up by a thousand. Those are different accounting points. And a lot of startups I see confuse um, sales, bookings, with rev re recognized revenues. Um, and these are little accounting things which can have uh, a lot of impact in the longer term. And yes, you can fix those things down the road and go back and revise your books and make it easier. But from the investor's point of view, it's definitely much easier if they see upfront that even at a small scale, even when they're making you know, a few hundred euros in sales, that the startups are, ca are organizing their accounting in a simple but straightforward but correct manner. So then it will carry forward. And then all of the believability of the numbers that you see is, is much better. And so, you know, I'll spend time sometimes helping startups say, you know, think about how you're recognizing those revenues. What time, at what point the, are they revenues or not? And that depends on whether you're selling a product, a service, a subscription over time. You know, there are some things, but those are basic accounting things which are worth paying some attention to so that when you send that spreadsheet to the investor, when they say, well, can you send me your, your financial metrics? When you send that spreadsheet, it's organized and clear and the numbers are in the right place. So that's one of the metrics things that I often see startups haven't got, got ready yet. The other is cohorts. So I don't know how many of you here have um, seen the term cohort. So a cohort is basically a way of organizing the metrics of the company, um, and that could be on revenues on, on sales. It could also be on users, on when users sign up and whether they're active, but organizing it by the time at which point the user came on board and was signed up. So, so that would mean that basically you're looking at, say, uh, February 2018 customers signed up. You know, what was the average, uh, the average monthly you know, billing, say, how, how much they were paying, um, what proportion of those customers are still signed up now <coughs> in May. You know, et cetera. So, but organizing that information by the month, typically, in which that user or customer signed up. The reason this is important is it allows um, yourself, so it's a very useful in insights for yourselves, but also allows the investors to understand how the business is changing over time. Because what will happen is, uh, you know, back in February, you might have been pitching your product in a different way. You might have been going through a different sales channel and maybe your churn was much higher and your customers were dropping off. If you can show that that's different now a few months later, that's to your advantage. And you want to be looking not at necessarily all the users you have all together in one bunch, but looking at them by cohort in terms of time to be able to see if you're improving. Are the new customers you're signing on um, better customers, the right customers, right? Are they staying? Um, and you want to be able to track that by cohort. So this is the second thing on, 
on metrics that, that we usually uh, have a discussion with startups about putting together. And, and actually, um, Christoph Jans from Point9 Capital has some blog posts out there about, um, you know, he's got Google Sheets, it's all out there, it's easy to do with, with how to set up cohort analysis. And so this is the second thing that you should definitely think about. So number five is tailor your pitch um, in terms of um, explaining to the specific investor why your startup will be good for them. And this is kind of the next stage of, of doing that research. So once you have that meeting, so think about how you are going to pitch your startup in the context of what they are doing, right? Have you read that investor's website to understand and remind yourself exactly what their investment focus is? What are they looking for? Have you looked at the, the profiles of the investors you're going to meet and said, all right, I can see this person has an interest in fintech um, or whatever, and, and I want to try and tailor my pitch so that it, it suits them, right? Um, and that might mean that you have to move slides around, you want to do it in a different order. So think about, about that. It's, it's kind of like sales 101. So when I go and sell to a, to when I did enterprise sales, I didn't go to BMW and sell the same pitch that I went to a hospital, right? So I changed the pitch, I changed the story, even though the product might have been some, something similar. So it's the same with, with, with investors. And the kind of the goal of all this is to create competition. So my advice for, um, for you in, as founders in being most successful in fundraising is to create competition. You want to create the situation where there are several investors who are lining up and are desperate to invest in your business and are convinced that you know, if they don't sign quickly, then someone else is going to do the deal instead of them. Right? This, is, this should be your goal. So all of these things before you know, feed into that, but also the thinking about how to organize a fundraising. So um, the ideal way to organize a fundraising is to not be raising, explicitly not be raising for whatever period of time until you're ready and you've got all the materials prepared, you've, got, you've built some of the relationships that you're going to then access, um, you're really prepared, and then you open fundraising. And then you actually, uh, the CEO basically says goodbye to the day-to-day -day business, um, I'm now fundraising, and absolutely focus on that um, and try to get that ball moving as fast as possible so that so that you end up with a situation where at least two investors at around the same time are saying, hmm, this looks like a really good investment opportunity. I'll think about putting out a term sheet. And at that point, you're creating competition and you have some choice, right? So um, it doesn't always work out. Believe me, it doesn't always work out. But the most effective uh, fundraisers are the startups that can create this competition and that can uh, give themselves multiple options. And that basically gives you negotiating leverage. So we like founders who can do this. Um, and you know, I'm much happier being in a deal where the founders also have other term sheets because I know that this founder will turn around and then go and sell very effectively to their customers or whoever else because they're, they're, they have the ability to create uh, competition, to create scarcity. And, um, and that will get you the best terms. And it's the best way to insure against you know, all sorts of nasty terms that can, can show up in, 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 in term sheets. So um, there are times, of course, when you open the fundraising and it doesn't really work out, and then you have to stretch, and that gets tougher. But your goal should be, ideally, to make it as short as possible and as focused as possible, and to get mul multiple term sheets out there. So. Um, I don't know if we have time for questions. I heard that the timing is pretty good, but I'm happy to take some questions if anyone has any. Um, I don't know if we have a mic. We have a mic there, I guess. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to shoot. Thank you for the great presentation, Andres. Thanks. S sorry, yeah, go on. Thank you. And uh, my question would be, you as a managing partner of a venture capital firm, what do you look for the most? Because uh, just a few speeches ago, uh, we were told that you know in the U.S. the PowerPoint, the presentation sells, 
in Europe, the spreadsheet, the Excel uh, cells, you know. So is, is there, out of all the six parts you presented, is there any one you focus on most? Uh, you yourself, uh, you know, put a lot of emphasis on cash flows and accounting. So just what's the most important thing you, you look for? And maybe some other parts, you know, you can look. look okay, under. so Thanks. so let me... Thanks. It's a really good question. So the question was, what do we look for? And, and so, so the, the number one thing we look for, we're investing very early. So pre-seed and seed, we know that at that stage, 100% sure your product will change. It might even change dramatically before you're successful. 100% sure your market will change. It might change dramatically before you're successful. The, st the stable thing might be the team. So at our stage, we're looking number one at the team. We want to meet the people. That's also why we want to meet them repeatedly, ideally, before we invest. So um, even outside spreadsheets and PowerPoints, what we're investing in is people and their capability to just knock down walls, to have the grit, the passion and perseverance to really succeed and go all the way to build a massive business, which is a very hard thing to do. Having said that, so... The next thing, uh, PowerPoint or deck, uh, pitch deck, is really important. Um, and that is the first kind of filter that we will have. I will, if I don't know the entrepreneur at all, I will often ask them to email me a pitch deck before talking to them. Why do I do that? So the reason I do that is I want to see that they can tell a story on paper, right, on a, a written story. And a PowerPoint, a pitch deck should be a story. It's a story about your business. It's a story about why, why is what you're doing important? Why will it be successful? Why, will, why should I fund that business, right? So, so the way you put that together um, is really important. Um, and so that, you know, the ability to weave that information together in, in a compelling narrative is something that is very important in the pitch deck. And by the way, the one you send by email might be different from the one you're giving when you face-to-face -face present, right? Because when you're sending in an email, then I have time to read sort of more information. When it's face-to-face, -face, actually, you don't want me to be reading off the slides. You want me to be paying attention to the story you're actually telling me, right? So that's, that's important. The spreadsheet is kind of a must, a minimum hurdle must have, right? So. If you if you do if you're a great looking team that looks really exciting, you have a great pitch deck, but you send me a spreadsheet that looks like it's full of holes and all sorts of assumptions are weird and inconsistent, etc. Obviously, then I'm going to go, Ugh. all right, this is not that great. Um, so that's kind of a necessary condition. So you need to have that spreadsheet ready as backup, but I would never send that spreadsheet until you've had the conversation and you first need to win the investor with the story, right? What's the compelling story? Why am I, why am I going to spend my scarce resources and scarce time you know, focusing on your business, right? And then the spreadsheet comes afterwards as the backup for, all right, and I'm organized and consistent, coherent, and I've got my shit together in terms of this spreadsheet. Make sense? Okay, any other questions? Okay, no other questions? Um, everyone needs some more coffee this morning, I guess. Um, so, um, it's not morning, it's already lunchtime. So everyone wants to go to lunch, that must be the problem. So, thank you very much. I appreciate the, uh, the time and the attention. Um, I'll be around here today and tomorrow. Uh, great to see you all and uh, have a great event. Thanks.